Thank you uh, for the invitation. So I'm going to present you a summary, essentially, of my, uh, of my thesis that I did with uh, Gabriel Perret at TNS. And this is a joint work also with uh, Marco Couturi, Francis Bach, and Lena Chisa. Um, yeah. Okay, so the motivation here is to uh, introduce a new notion to compare probability measures um, in, in various settings, so either continuous, discrete, or, or a mix of both. Um, and so I'm going to, to motivate this uh, with a, a couple of, of examples. So the first one, which is a full discrete setting, um, is quantization. So suppose you have a large point cloud um, here represented in, in orange, and you have another, um, so you want to summarize this large point cloud with a, a smaller number of points. And so you want to minimize some notion of distance between the orange point cloud here and the, and the blue point cloud whose positions you can move. And so you have a minimization problem um, over uh, discrete measures here. And so the, the, the variables that you um, are minimizing over are the, the positions of the blue points. Um, and, and the goal is just to summarize your large um, data set with a, a smaller number of points. And so you want to look for the positions of the blue points that are going to uh, fit your, your target point cloud in the, in the best possible way. Another motivation, which uh, would be in a semi-discrete setting, is, is density fitting. So again, you have uh, some, some data set according to an unknown distribution beta. And you want, again, to um, learn some parametric distribution alpha theta that is going to minimize the distance between your, your data set and, the, um, and your model alpha theta. And so again, you want to uh, do some minimization with respect to a notion of distance between measures um, to find the, the model that will best fit your data. And so the question is what notion of, of distance are we going to use here for these, uh, for these minimization problems? So the probably most common used one um, is the notion of phi divergences that was introduced in the 60s by Caesar. And that essentially um, compares the odds ratio of the uh, two probabilities that you want to compare, alpha and beta. And the best known example is the kullback leibler divergence, uh, whose definition you have here. And so you can see that when alpha and, and beta don't have the same support, um, this, this thing is not going to work well. And so in, in particular, uh, a big issue of these uh, phi divergences, and that's here illustrated with the kullback leibler divergence, um, is that it doesn't metrize the weak convergence of, of measures. So what does it mean in a simple example here? So you have um, a target Dirac here in, in blue um, that is at zero, and you have a sequence of, of Dirac located at one over n. And so you can see that when n increases, your, your orange uh, Dirac, so your sequence, is going closer to your target um, delta zero. But if you just look at the signal that is given by the uh, KL divergence between alpha n and alpha, it's always equal to plus infinity. So this notion of, of distance doesn't give you any signal. So you can see that it's if you're trying to solve a minimization problem, for instance, the, the gradients are not going to give you any information because this thing is always uh, equal to plus infinity. And so formally, the, the, the mathematical notion that kind of corresponds to the idea um, is, is metrizing weak convergence. And so what it means is that if you take a sequence of, of probabilities alpha n that um, weakly converges to alpha, you want to have a notion of distance under which it's equivalent to converge to zero under that distance and weakly converge um, for, the, for the sequence of, uh, of measures. And so this is the case, for instance, of another uh, notion of distance, which is maximum mean discrepancies that were introduced by uh, Arthur Gretton in a little while ago now. Um, and these distances are based on the, on the notion of RKHS. So for those of you who would not be familiar with RKHS, essentially it's a, a space of function that is endowed with a kernel function k. Um, and all functions in that, um, in that RKHS have the specific property that you can write them um, as the, the scalar product of a representer of your function here against the, the kernel function k. Um, and so if you have, um, if you consider, so given this uh, RKHS structure, you can uh, consider that notion of distance 
So you look at the um, average of a test function f under each of your measures alpha and beta. So you look at the uh, mean discrepancy um, and for, of f under alpha and beta, and you, you take the supremum over all um, test functions f that are in the, uh, in the unit ball of your KHS. So this falls under the, the framework of a larger notion of, of distance, which are called integral probability metrics, um, where you can use other classes of test functions f. So for instance, if you take um, functions that are one Lipschitz, you would recover the one Wasserstein distance. If you take uh, functions that are upper bounded by one, you would recover total variation. So it's kind of a flexible framework. Um, but here, the nice thing when you take the unit ball of RKHS is that you can leverage this um, uh, decomposition of f here to, to get this supremum under closed form, and you can just simply express it using um, expectations of your kernel function with respect to product measures. And so once you have that uh, formula, you can see that you have a very um, simple estimator of your, uh, okay. <laughs> you have a very simple estimator of your uh, MMD because you can just take um, samples from your, your, both your measures alpha and beta and take the empirical expectations here and you get, um, an estimator of MMD that can be uh, uh, computed uh, quadratically with the, the number of samples you have. Another, um, oh, and so just to go back to this weak convergence, so under um, simple assumptions on the, on the kernel function K here, uh, we know that MMDs metrize weak convergence. Another notion of distance between measures is, a, is, optim, is based on optimal transport. So optimal transport is a pretty old problem from the um, 18th century. Um, so you consider a cost, C, of moving a unit of mass from a, a point in your measure alpha to a point in your measure beta. And so you're looking for the coupling pi, um, which here in this discrete setting is just a, a matrix that tells you how, mem how much mass you move from a point x to a point y. So for instance, if you take um, this point here, you know that you're going to split some of the mass to this point and some of the mass to that point. And so it gives you a correspondence between, um, between the two measures. And so you're looking for the optimal transport is looking for the coupling that minimizes the total cost of moving all the mass from your first measure alpha to your second measure beta. And mathematically, so it's, uh, it's, it's formalized this way. So you're minimizing over the, the set of coupling measures that have marginals alpha and beta. And so you're looking at the uh, total cost of moving your mass from alpha to beta. And it's, it's highly dependent on the, the notion of, uh, of cost that you use, so how, how expensive is it to move mass from x to y. Um, and the classic choice is just some power of the Euclidean distance, and that's what we call the p Wasserstein distance, when we take the p power of the um, Euclidean distance as a, as a cost function. It satisfies all the, the axioms of a distance, and it metrizes weak convergence between measures. So it has a lot of, uh, uh, of nice properties. So now that we have these two options, um, maybe you can compare them for, um, for learning purposes. So two things that we care about would be sample complexity. So how easy, um, I mean, how robust it is to estimate your distance from samples of the measures instead of the actual measures themselves. And the other aspect is the computational time um, required to compute your, your distance from samples. So if you look at MMD, uh, if you're estimating MMD from samples, you, of, of size n, you converge with a rate one over square root of n, so it's independent of, of dimension, so it has a pretty good um, sample complexity compared to optimal transport that suffers from a, a curse of dimension. Here you have this factor uh, minus one over square root of d. So essentially when your dimension increases, the number of samples that you need to guarantee a good approximation of optimal transport based on samples is going to grow exponentially. Um, and on the computational side, well, MMD is, is also winning here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, to estimate MMD from samples, you're essentially computing uh, expectations over product measures. So it's just uh, if you have samples of size, size n, this costs n square. Uh, whereas optimal transport, you have to solve a linear program. Uh, and the, the complexity is, is cubic. So on, on both aspects, it seems that uh, MMD would be a better choice. So why do we still care about using optimal transport? Well, if you consider the simple example from, from earlier, so it's the same setting as quantization, except here I consider they have the same number of points for, for both measures. And I want to see how both notions of distance are going to behave uh, when I do gradient descent uh, over this, uh, uh, this function. So here's what happened when I do MMD. So there are some points, the points that are kind of um, 
um, less represented in my, in my point cloud, so that are further away from the, uh, from the mean, are not going to be recovered by the, um, by the, the MMD distance when I do the, the gradient descent. And so the, the points here are just uh, lagging behind and kind of floating in, in an area that I don't want them to be in. When I do this with optimal transport, the points are matched very uh, quickly to their target position. And what happens actually is that the points uh, follow a straight line between their initial position um, and where, sorry, their initial position and the point they're matched to when you remember this coupling uh, thing. So you're just following their coupling in a straight line and that, that's what happens when, um, when you do gradient descent with, uh, with optimal transport. So here's a maybe more complicated example where you have two um, point clouds to, to fit. And so here's what happens with MMD. You have the point clouds, the, the points in the blue measure that are um, exploding everywhere and then trying to go back slowly to the, to the target measure in orange, but you have all these points lagging behind and it, would, it takes a really, really long time um, for them to, to go back to, their, um, um, to the, the position they're supposed to go to. Whereas for optimal transport, once again, it's a pretty straightforward uh, matching. And so it's, uh, it takes a little while. So sorry, it's a little bumpy, but uh, it's just a scale problem with Python, I guess. So the, the, uh, the, act, sorry, the actual minimum uh, for MMD would also be something that looks like this? Or? Right, so MMD is, a, is, is, is positive definite. So you, you would expect you have the same number of points in the, in the same measures in the blue and the yellow measure, so the, the minimum is just satisfied when the blue measure is, like the blue points are in the yellow points. For both. For both. It's just that the gradients for MMD are, are not that good, um, and they're having a really hard time um, pushing the points back to where they're supposed to go. But the minimum is, is attained uh, at the same, um, yeah, you essentially know that the minimum is when the, the orange point, the blue points are in the orange points, but it's just, Exactly, yeah. Right, so what happens here with, with MMD, um, so you have, indeed you have two terms, and so it seems that the uh, repulsion potential is, is acting first and like sending the points very far, and then the attraction potential has to work really hard um, to get the points back to, the, um, back to their position. Um, but yeah, it's the effect of both, both terms that you, can, that you can see here. Right, so that, that's at least one good thing for, for optimal transport and the motivation to, to try to come up with ways to, to solve these, these two issues here because we, we can see that in, in practical applications, um, optimal transport seems to be a, a better notion of, of distance to solve these minimization problems. But yeah. your results are heavily dependent on the discretization machine, right? So that might be a discretization machine that makes it any faster. Uh, right, so here it's, okay, I've, I've tested with a, with a bunch of uh, different step sizes and uh, like even the fancier Adam. And so with, if, if you use something better, uh, so I mean, maybe a bit more evolved than the uh, vanilla gradient descent. So here it's just gradient descent with a backtracking line, line search. Um, it's not as bad, but it's still pretty bad. So I've, yeah. Right, right. So it's optimized for both <laughs> the the gradient step. And, uh, also yeah. Maybe the, 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 the to in the yeah, for sure. Yeah. So do you take that into account when you compare uh, the, the two complexities? Does that sort of two on the step of gradient descent this is what happens, but for one the gradient descent is much faster than for the other? Yeah, right. So that's that's why we, that's why we want to find something that still allows us to have these good gradients but without suffering from these, uh, these two issues. And so that's what I'm going to address here. So the, the big trend in computational optimal transport is to use entropic uh, regularization to address the, the computational burden of optimal transport. And so it's a, an idea from um, Marco Couturier. Um, so essentially you look at your uh, classic um, optimal transport formulation here and you add an extra term, which is the entropy of your uh, transport map here that you're minimizing over with respect to the product of your marginal measures. 
And this is just the, the classic entropy. And it has the effect of, of smoothing the problem. In particular, if you look at the convex dual of optimal transport. Um, so here is the, the dual, the convex dual for a standard optimal transport, so without regularization. So you went from minimizing over the, the, the space of couplings to maximizing over two dual potentials, which each correspond to uh, the marginal constraint of being equal to um, marginal alpha and, and beta. And so when you look at the dual of optimal transport, you have this constraint on the potential that their sum is smaller than your cost function. Um, so for instance, the Euclidean distance, but any cost function that you choose. So you still have a, a constraint problem, but when you regularize, the constraint that you had um, becomes smooth here. And so you're essentially just penalizing the fact that the sum um, is, uh, is larger than the cost. And so you, you replace your, your constraint by just this expen exponential penalty. And so you now have a smooth dual problem, uh, which is much easier to solve. And you can actually see here that you have, um, so you're maximizing over two variables and the, the problem is concave in these, uh, in these variables. So you can just alternately maximize over each of these variables and, and, and converge, to some, uh, um, converge to the optimum. And so that's exactly what we call in the literature Sinkhorn's algorithm, to just fix one variable, maximize over the other, and then alternate until convergence. Um, and so here in the discrete case, it just involves, so you have a, a kernel matrix K that is uh, essentially encoding the information of your, of your cost between pairwise points in a discrete setting and just solving these uh, running synchronous algorithm is just going to, uh, to do ma um, matrix vector multiplications at each iteration. And so each, the complexity of each iteration is, is O of N square. So it's comparable to MMD. Of course, there is, there is no free lunch here um, when you're regularization parameter goes to zero here, epsilon. So when you are trying to approximate true optimal transport, um, your convergence rate is going to uh, degrade pretty badly when, uh, when epsilon goes to zero. So you're, you're going to have to run, a, it's still going to be quadratic complexity, but you're going to have to run it for a very long number of iterations, so you're not um, gaining much. There's a, a trade-off between regularizing and, um, and, and getting faster uh, algorithm. Okay, so an, a nice um, bonus to, to this synchronous procedure is that it, it gives a, an approximation of optimal transport that is fully differentiable. And so this is pretty convenient when you want to plug in uh, transport in, in other uh, uh, learning problems that would involve neural networks. And um, so it, it gives you a differentiable approximation of optimal transport. And so there are uh, different applications that um, flourished recently. So notably, there's differentiable uh, sorting by uh, Marco and, and co-authors. Um, so what they do is essentially they say, well, optimal transport in one dimension is just sorting. So I compute my optimal transport in, uh, in, in one dimension using synchron, and then this just gives me a, a differentiable uh, way of, of sorting. You can also use this to define different, differentiable assignments, as uh, your, your coupling matrix gives you, a, um, your regularized coupling matrix gives you a soft assignments. Uh, you can also use it to do differentiable clustering, and, and in particular, what, we are, what I'm going to focus on in the rest of the talk is to use it to learn uh, with a regularized Wasserstein loss. So I'm going to use um, this, this notion of regularized transport uh, to, for, for uh, learning problems. So we've seen that this uh, adding this uh, entropic penalty solves the computational um, problem of, of optimal transport, but there's still the sample complexity question that remains. Um, and so we're, we know that for optimal transport, when we're trying to estimate the Wasserstein distance between two measures using samples of these measures of, of size n, um, we have this, this rate here, which degrades um, with dimension. So it's, it's not just the dimension of the, of the ambient space in which your measures leave, it's actually the, the lower dimensional manifold on which your, your measures leave. So you can, it's, it's a bit better um, uh, in, in some cases, but it's still uh, pretty bad news. Here for MMD, you have a sample complexity of, um, in, in one over square root of n. And so the question is, what can we say about this, this regularized version of transport? And so actually, what we proved is that um, regularized optimal transport has a sample complexity that interpolates between optimal transport and, and MMD at both ends. Um, so here, you have both asymptotics. So when epsilon is small, you have a sample complexity here in one over square root of n, but with a pretty bad constant uh, in one over epsilon to the, to the d over two. So here you have your, your curse of dimension when uh, epsilon is small. 
But when epsilon is large enough, you have something that scales as one over square root of n, so you recover something that is uh, closer to the sample complexity of MMD. And so it gives you in, in, intuitively the, the fact that a large enough regularization um, breaks the curse of, of dimension for optimal transport. Okay. So now that we have a, a new notion of distance, so this regularized uh, Wasserstein distance that has better statistical properties and that also has good um, computational properties, we can start to use it for uh, our learning problems, right? So let's consider the same problem as, as before, so I, where I want to fit my uh, um, orange point cloud with the blue point cloud, and here use the regularized Wasserstein distance. And actually, that's, that's pretty bad. That's really not what I want because I have my uh, blue point clouds here that are concentrating kind of at the mean of my, uh, of my orange point cloud. And so we are kind of disappointed. Um, but actually, this is due to the effect of entropy, and it's something that was, um, that, that has this, uh, um, you, can, you can theoretically explain it uh, with the fact that entropy, um, entropy regularized transport is equivalent to um, maximum likelihood um, estimation under a Gaussian noise. So for instance, you assume that you have um, a sample that is generated from some uh, random variable with distribution alpha theta, plus some, some, some uh, Gaussian noise with variance epsilon. So here the data that you observe, the, the xi's, are, are according to some distribution that you're trying to estimate, alpha theta, that was corrupted by some noise. And so if you want to learn the MLE for this corrupted model here, um, it's essentially, it's, it's actually exactly the same as minimizing the regularized Wasserstein distance with regularization epsilon between your model and, and your point clouds. And your, sorry, and your empirical measure uh, here. And so that's, that's what you observe. Um, if you look at the point clouds here, you can actually, it's, it's like there is some, uh, some Gaussians here. Um, and so it just assumes that everything that's like, um, the deviations from the mean are just noise that you're trying to cancel out um, when, you're, uh, when you're estimating your, your model. So this can be a, a good property if you know your level of noise in, the, uh, in your data and you're uh, just trying to, to cancel out that noise, but here it's not what we want. We would like to be able to recover fully the, the orange point cloud. Um, and the, the answer that we came up with that was very naive is just to try to debias this, this regularized Wasserstein distance um, simply because when you take the Wasserstein distance between the measure and itself, because of entropy, it's not equal to zero. So we decided to just subtract these two terms to ensure that we have something that is equal to zero, and that's what we call synchron divergences. So it's just regularized optimal transport minus these two cross terms that ensure that when you take alpha equal beta, you have something that is equal to zero. So just a very naive way of making sure that we have something which is equal to zero when we want it to be. But actually, it has this uh, nice interpolation property where when you take epsilon that goes to zero, well, you have something that converges to transport, which is what you hoped for because you defined it based on unregularized transport. So when your regularization goes to zero, you go back to, uh, to classic Wasserstein distance. But when you take what's more, maybe more surprising is that when you take um, your regularization that goes to infinity, the synchron divergence converges to some MMD where the kernel function of MMD is minus the cost of optimal transport. Um, and, and of course, here it's not going to be an MMD for any cost function C. But if you take cost function C that are a power of the Euclidean distance of strictly smaller than two, uh, you get an MMD that is called the energy distance and that actually gives you a real uh, notion of, of distance and that, that is a um, uh, well-defined uh, well notion of distance between measures. And so here's what happened when, uh, when I replaced my regularized transport with uh, uh, synchron divergences. And so you can see that I have um, slightly the same behavior as MMD in the sense that points are not matched directly to their uh, target in the optimal transport matching, but there's no points lagging behind. Um, and the matching is not perfect, but it's much, much better than, than MMD. And using a better um, um, gradient methods than just a simple gradient descent. So if you use fancier uh, gradient methods, you can actually recover the the, the positions um, in a better way. But even just doing vanilla gradient descent on these problems uh, still gives something that it's much more satisfactory than, than MMD. So here's the example for, for the, the two point clouds. And so you can see that the dynamic is, is kind of the same as MMD, so the points are a little bit exploding, but they're not exploding as much, <laughs> and they're going back much, much quicker to their, to their target. 
So as, as you pointed out, Claire, that here there's also an attractive and repulsive term if you look at the definition of synchron divergence. Um, here is my attractive terms that drives the measure of alpha to, to beta. And here is my repulsive terms that make sure that I don't collapse to the mean of the point cloud. Right. So if, you, if I summarize what we've seen so far, so we were looking at this uh, point cloud fitting problem. So when we're using just simple uh, regularized Wasserstein distance, we are collapsing to the mean of the uh, point cloud. And so of course, when we take epsilon that decreases, so we take a regularization that goes to zero, you recover something that is uh, behaving like optimal transport, so you're going to have something that, that fits the point cloud better, but it's at the, uh, the cost of a much, much higher computational cost. Um, because the smaller epsilon is, the more synchronous iterations you have to, to do, and so the, the more expensive your gradients are. So you want to kind of have a trade-off between this computational complexity, but still having good gradients. Um, and here you can see that for the same regularization, so essentially it's going to cost you the same to compute the gradients, the synchronous divergence is, is performing much, much better. And of course, when you increase epsilon too much, um, you, you converge to energy distance, so MMD with the Euclidean cost. And so you can see that you have the points that are lagging behind um, similar to, to MMD. And so you can really see here that this synchronous divergence is interpolating between what you would expect for, from optimal transport and, and what you get for, for MMD. And so here, when I, when I talk about MMD, I'm, I'm focusing on MMD with, uh, with the Euclidean kernel, so minus the Euclidean distance as a, as a kernel. Um, if, if I use the, the Gaussian kernel, it's much, much worse um, because you can, so Gaussian, um, using MMD with a Gaussian kernel has vanishing gradients. So essentially, when you have this, um, this repulsive term here, sorry, in the, in the MMD, it's a bit far. So if, if I use a Gaussian, um, a Gaussian kernel here, the repulsive terms just send the points very far away, and then they're too far for the Gaussian kernel to bring them back. So actually, this, this is an insight that we kind of got from, from this uh, interpolation property of optimal transport, is that if, you, if it, it converges to, um, to MMD with a, a Euclidean kernel, and it's actually much better than using a Gaussian kernel, essentially because your gradients don't finish. So it's going to take a lot of time for your points to come back, but at least they're coming back, which wouldn't be the case with a, um, a Gaussian kernel. Okay, so note I've hopefully convinced you that uh, synchronous divergences are a good notion of distance to use in these uh, minimization problems over measure. Um, we're able to use them in something a bit more complicated than just a point cloud fitting. Uh, and, and the application here that I have are generative models. So generative models are a specific uh, uh, kind of probabilistic models where you have a, a, tar uh, sorry, a lower dimensional distribution um, zeta here, that is, for instance, a uniform distribution in a low dimensional space. And then you push it forward through a push forward function g zeta to a high dimensional space, which is the space of your data. And this gives you some, some model distribution alpha zeta here. And you want to learn, again, the, the parameters that are going to minimize the distance between your uh, model measure alpha zeta and your uh, um, data measure beta. So the thing in generative models is that they're um, very easy to sample from. You just have to sample from your, um, your, your latent uh, distribution zeta in your low dimensional space, and then you apply your, um, your push forward function g zeta to your, uh, your samples from the, from the reference me measure uh, zeta, and so you get uh, samples from, from alpha theta. And so, both, um, if you look at your data measure and your, and your model measure here, it's easy to obtain samples of both these measures, but it's, it's, you can't really uh, uh, do much more, so you can't do maximum likelihood estimation with these uh, kind of problems, so you have to come up with something, um, something else. And what we propose here is to use synchronous divergence, and so we're going to minimize over um, the parameter theta, the synchronous divergence between the model measure alpha theta and, and the model measure beta. Um, but since we can only access them through, through samples, we have to make some, uh, um, some approximations here. So there are two approximations that we make. The first one is that we take empirical um, approximations of the, of the two measures. And then, and, and then on top of that, we are going to uh, approximate the synchronous divergence by running a fixed number L of, it, of iterations of the synchronous algorithm. And so once we have this uh, approximation here, so approximation both because we take samples and because we run a, a fixed number of iterations here, 
um, once we have this approximation of the synchronous divergence between the, the two measures we care about, we can take a gradient step. Uh, sorry, you can compute the gradient, and we compute the so we compute the exact gradient of the approximate function. So it's it's a bit different from the perspective where um, you have an exact formula for the gradient and you're going to approximate your gradient with Monte Carlo. Here we compute an approximate. Um, uh, an approximation of the distance we care about, but then we compute the exact gradient uh, using aut uh, automatic uh, differentiation. And so then we can just do a, an update in a, a stochastic uh, uh, gradient way. And so here's what it, it looks like in, in, in practice in a more schematic way. So you have your regenerative model, so you draw some samples according to your latent distribution zeta. You apply your push forward function g zeta, which is um, most of the time going to be a a big neural network, and so you get some, some samples distributed according to your model alpha theta. You also take some, some data points in your uh, data set here, distributed according to this unknown distribution beta. You uh, compute their cost matrix, and then you run a few synchronous steps, um, and this gives you your, your approximation of the distance between your, your generative models and your data. And so everything here is a uh, Differentiable, so you can just backpropagate through this whole procedure to get the gradient with respect to, to theta. Okay, so here are some toy results in, in 3D because it's always easier to, to visualize um, what's happening. So here the generative model is, is very simple, so it's ellipses. So here the latent distribution would be just a uniform inside a, inside a ball. Um, inside a unit ball, and then we, um, the push forward function is just a deformation of the ball into an ellipse, so moving the center and, and applying a covariance matrix to, um, uh, to, to deform the ellipse. And so when I'm trying to fit that generative model um, using regularized transport, I have the same problem as before where the ellipse that I'm uh, fitting is just collapsed at the mean of my points, so the, it's, it's completely flat. Whereas when I use synchronous divergences, I recover um, my full um, uh, ellipse that I used to generate the, the blue points. And so here's a comparison between energy distance and, and synchronous divergence. So it's, um, energy distance is not too bad, but if you look at the um, parameter est estimation compared to the, the ground truth, so here's the covariance of the ellipse and here are the centers, um, you can see that synchronous divergence is more faithful to the, to the initial um, <coughs> parameters. Okay, so here I was considering a very simple problem, so just fitting um, points in 3D, so the Euclidean distance was a good notion of distance to use um, between my points, but when you're considering a more, more complicated generative model, so for instance, learning images, uh, learning to generate images, you need to have a good notion of distance between images. And so what you can do um, is to learn the cost C in an adversarial way, and so intuitively, you're going to want to have a, a cost function C that is high when alpha is, is different from beta so that you can differentiate uh, your, your true samples and your model samples very well in an adversarial way. And so you just parameterize the cost function um, via a neural network here. So you learn an embedding um, F phi here and you look at the Euclidean distance on this embedding and this is your, your new cost function. And so now instead of just uh, minimizing over the, the parameters of your model alpha theta, you're also maximizing over the parameters of your cost function, and you go back to a GAN type uh, problem, okay, where your cost function C acts as a discriminator. Um, and so this allows us to tackle more complicated uh, generative models, and so in, in particular generative models of, of images, um, where here you have uh, results on, on CIFAR 10. Um, so this, this paper is uh, a couple of, of years old, and so it's uh, very, very old in, in GAN world. So this is very uh, not state of the art anymore, but at the time um, we compared ourselves to the, the MMD, uh, um, MMD GANs from, from Lee et al. And we could uh, obtain better inception scores. Um, so I, I guess in GAN world this is very outdated, but it still gives you an idea that optimal transport works pretty well if you're trying to minimize um, um, over measures for more complicated problems and just point cloud fitting. Right, so I'm just going to conclude with the take home message. So what I, I would like you to, to get away from this talk. So synchronous diver divergences um, are a good notion of distance between measures, especially when you're uh, trying to solve minimization problems over the, the space of measures. They are a way to debias the regularized Wasserstein distance. 
Um, and they have the nice property of interpolating between optimal transport for, some, for small epsilon and MMD for large epsilon. And this interpolation is in a, a very large sense. Um, so essentially what I mean here is that you inherit the geometric properties from optimal transport, but you also break the curse of dimension for epsilon large enough, so you have um, good properties for learning problems that come from this connection with optimal transport, but you get all the good statistical um, and computational properties that you also have with, with MMD. Um, and the good thing is we have fast algorithm for implementation in, in machine learning tasks. Um, so you can now use it in your, in your favorite learning problem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.